Uh, thank you very much. We thought we'd end the forum on something, with something light. <laughs> discretionary stimuluses, non-discretionary stimuluses, effect on pension funds of uh, unsustainable budgets and the, and the rest. Um, we've got a very distinguished panel. Um, I'm not going to go through their biographies, I'll, but I'll just introduce them briefly. Jokema Almunier, uh, Commissioner for Economic and Monetary Affairs at the European Commission, uh, a lawyer and an economist, I think. We have Senator Bob Bennett from Robert Bennett from Utah, uh, who serves, among other things, on the Joint Economic Committee of the Congress. Um, we have a uh, very distinguished as, uh, as we heard, Jean Pisani Ferry of the director of the Bruegel Institute. Uh, one of the best, and I say that as a consumer of these uh, things, one of the best think tanks uh, in Europe. And we have Axel Weber, the president of the Bundesbank and a member of the ECB's governing council. So, all the expertise that you need uh, in four chairs just here. Now, before I start, I just want to make a, a small confession. Because while some of you perhaps were having a nightcap last night, uh, or enjoying the, the late night debate in the bar, um, I was reading something called The State of Public Finances, Outlook and Medium Term Policies after the 2008 crisis, uh, and this was produced uh, the other week by the International Monetary Fund. I, um, I recommend it, not just as a sedative, <laughs> but also as a, as a serious document which for me um, made me realize how quite a lot of the things that have been written and said about this debate haven't really been grounded in facts and figures. We all know about lies, damn lies and statistics, but there hasn't been, I think, a great deal of clarity in the debate and lots of things have been said about how different countries are behaving which aren't quite true. Like, I will give you a small example. One of the things that shocked me as a European is if you look at these numbers, Germany's discretionary stimulus, the, the amount it's putting to, into its economy, is twice the level of France's. Now that seems counterintuitive because Germany's been getting quite a lot of uh, uh, opprobrium for its, its position. So I think one needs to be careful with some of the numbers and the assumptions. That said, two tensions come out when you look at the documents and look at the figures closely. The first is the tension that runs through this crisis, and that's the tension between the short term and the medium term. Lots of things that are very sensible to do in the short term to try and get our economies out of this mire have very bad medium term consequences. So the trick, if you can call it that, for policymakers is to strike the right balance between doing important and necessary things now but not ruining their economies for the next for three, two, three, five years. I think the second thing that comes out is this difference between the way the United States is behaving and European. It's not quite as big as uh, it's been suggested, but it seems to me an almost cultural one. And I was thinking of you know, someone coming across a, a train wreck. And what I think the American reaction to that to a train wreck is to pull the train off the track and put another one on. What the European reaction, I think, is, to a degree, is, well, get the train off the track, but let's work out first how we can stop it happening again. And I think some of that cultural difference comes through. But I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going I'm to start with Mr. Almunia, and I'm going to ask him, is this sort of bashing of Europe for being 
too slow, too reluctant to push out its budgets. Uh, now, is this justified? And also, how is Europe going to strike this balance between the short-term imperative to get economies <coughs> moving and the medium-term risk? If you look at a lot of European countries, their debt positions look pretty, pretty tough in the medium term. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Well, I think Europe is doing what uh, should be done. Uh, we decided, as Europeans, uh, the 27 member states, to uh, give uh, to the, our economy a discretionary fiscal stimulus, around uh, 1.5 of our GDP. This decision was adopted in December. Now it's being implemented. We are, roughly speaking, this uh, stimulus that should be adopted uh, not only at the European level, but mostly at the national level by the different uh, governments and parliaments of our members. This uh, stimulus, broadly speaking, has been adopted, is being implemented. We need to monitor. We, d we said that this uh, stimulus should be uh, timely so as to have effects now that we need now the, the stimulus, uh, targeted so as to be efficient, not to use the public money in an efficient uh, uh, areas or, or sectors, and temporary. And this links with your uh, second and uh, big concern, how we will withdraw <coughs> this stimulus and how we will pursue a strategy of budgetary discipline, of fiscal sustainability over the medium to long term. And right now we know that uh, the increase in public debt uh, and in, in liabilities, contingent liabilities or explicit liabilities for the next years in Europe is uh, huge, as it is the case in other, in other countries of the world, indeed. We have problems in uh, countries, European countries, that did not consolidate their public finances before the crisis. I can give two very well-known examples. Greece and Italy, whose public debt to GDP ratio before the crisis was around 1% of GDP. We are concerned by the situation of some uh, uh, countries whose public debt is increasing very, very fast because of the efforts needed, not only for fiscal stimulus, also to support the banking sector. And the, the, the amount of resources committed for the support of banking sector is huge in Europe and in the EU. And we are, uh, of course, extremely aware that uh, in the next decade, we will be uh, facing aging and the consequences of aging of our, on our public finances is well known. So we need to have an exit strategy. We need to have uh, the political commitment to withdraw the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus and also the monetary stimulus, and Axel will talk uh, about this indeed, uh, once the uh, recovery will start. We cannot afford to uh, spend the next two decades absorbing the debt that we have created to tackle this very deep uh, recession. We have a very good instrument for this. In Europe, we have this fiscal framework, the Stability and Growth Pact, the way to monitor, to give surveillance, to uh, send recommendations to the member states so as to pursue medium-term budgetary strategies that are sustainable and long-term uh, budgetary and fiscal strategies that are sustainable. And I think this cooperation in a system where budgets are decentralized is being extremely useful, was useful to create the euro and to reap the benefits of the euro during the first decade, and I'm sure that will be extremely useful for the next uh, years. Thank you. So, Mr. Bennett, if we sort of move across the uh, Atlantic, if you look first at what the administration, the Congress, is doing in Washington in terms of very big stimulus, racking up very large deficits, are you getting that right in terms of focusing on the here and now rather than the two or three or four years down the road? And is there a credible uh, plan, as it were, to get the United States back on balance? Or shouldn't we, should we forget about that for now and just get, us, get ourselves out of the hole that we're in? Well, first let me lay down the caveat that you're asking a Republican. Republican, of course. And <laughs> <laughs> there were not very many Republican votes for the stimulus package. Yeah. So uh, 
I think it is safe to say, though, that there is significant difference. There are significant differences of opinion among economists, not just along partisan lines, about whether or not this is uh, going forward in an ad hoc manner or whether it's going forward with a thoughtful long-term fashion. And obviously, from my point of view, I think there's been a lot of ad hocracy going on with respect to this. I do believe that we need a large stimulus, and I'm prepared to vote for a large stimulus. But the temptation when you're dealing with the American Congress, the temptation to put something on the luggage car of a train moving the station is irresistible. And when you look at the stimulus package, particularly as it came out of the House, you see, I sit in the Senate, so it's easy to bash the House. Uh, if you look at it, particularly as it came out of the House, it contained a whole series of things that have been on the agenda of the now majority party for a number of years, regardless of the state of the economy, that those of us on the other side of the political divide say are not stimulative at all and they will simply add to the national debt long term, raise the baseline for future uh, budget calculations, and create a larger debt problem to have to deal with in the long term than the stimulus alone would be there. That is the core, really, of the debate that's going on in America right now about this. Everybody believes there should be a stimulus, but the makeup of the particular items that go in there is, is what's causing just, the, the just problem. To, just so I can be clear, in terms of order of magnitude, you're, you're saying that the Republicans are on the same side as the administration. I, I'm, I'm not sure we're on the same side as order of magnitude either, but we are on the same side that there needs to be something. We're willing to accept a very significant deficit this time. Now, the deficit is coming out, depending on whose score you take, at uh, eight and a half, ten percent, whatever, of GDP, and the United States has never run a deficit of that size outside of wartime. So you've got another bunch of economists who are coming forward and saying that's very dangerous. Now, the one thing that I have learned with absolute certainty, this one I know I will not be proven wrong, all of the scores, all of the budget figures dealing with the future will be wrong. <laughs> Every time there is a projection, it is always wrong. Sometimes it's on the high side, sometimes it's wrong on the low side. A uh, variety of reasons for that. We know what we can spend. We do not know what we will get in. Money does not come from the budget. Money comes from the economy, and the economy expands or contracts in ways that are impossible for the computers at CBO to uh, second guess. So whatever figure is being put forward as to the size of the deficit, it is wrong. Whether it's too high or too low, we'll, we'll have to find out. And that makes the future even scarier because right now we are looking at a deficit and, as I say, the building of the baseline on which uh, further appropriations will be made that uh, the United States has never had experience with before outside of wartime. And wars, you know, are going to end, whether this recession or depression, call it what you will, is going to end, yes, when, at what price, the scores are all wrong, we're all getting into a terra incognita here, and uh, so right now there's a sense of false security because in the situation where the world is as uncertain as it is there is a flock to the dollar the treasury auctions are oversubscribed people are basically paying us money to keep their money that is there's no real interest value whatsoever that will lead you into a false sense of security with respect to how you're going to finance this because that's clearly not going to be the case a few years from now. And if there is a flight from the dollar and a fear that the Americans are in too deeply, then in order to get people to give us the money we need to finance our debt, we will have to raise interest rates as dramatically as we have now cut them. And in that prospect, we could be facing a runaway inflation that could be very unha unhappy indeed. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to... Uh, Mr. Weber, uh, I, I really want to put two questions. One, uh, is this uh, 
is the sort of bashing that we see certainly in sections of the press but also among other politicians of Germany of be, as being too cautious, too slow. Is that fair? Well, I, I don't suppose you will say it's fair, but uh, explain why uh, it's not unfair. And could you tell us also how, you know, uh, how what governments are doing fiscally is influencing perhaps what the ECB uh, is doing on interest rates? Because one of the striking things is you look in the United States, it's effectively zero interest rates. If you look in my country, it's effectively zero. There's this funny thing called quantitative easing going on around on both sides of the Atlantic in the US and UK. The ECB, as I rates are still at one and a half percent, the ECB seems a bit more cautious. Is it trying, is it worried about the fiscal position? Does that have some, some uh, influence? Well, first thing, uh, let me also uh, say hello to everybody and I'm pleased to be here. Um, the difference you keep forgetting is that whilst rates are uh, at 1.5% in the euro area and heading down, short-term rates are way below our policy rates by now because we choose a particular modus of liquidity. giving bank liquidity, which means that short-term rates are below 1%. Actually, inflation in the euro area is just coming down to 1%. It's not a zero like in the United States. So the real rates are actually no different, uh, neither in the short term nor in the medium term, in the eurozone relative to the US. So in terms of monetary stimulus, I think we've put in as much monetary stimulus in a short period of time as central banks both in the UK and in the US have. Second issue, uh, let me sort of come back to this issue about why, whether Germany has done enough. I think the, the whole perception and the whole debate was about four points. The first one is Germany was perceived as having more room to maneuver relative to other countries in the EU. Well, we reached a balanced budget in good times, which has been the medium-term orientation of our policy all along. Having tightened up uh, fiscal uh, expenditure and having consolidated uh, means that we had more room to maneuver indeed and our package is larger than the package of many other countries. I, wouldn't, I don't want to go into examples but there are other large European countries that haven't put a discretionary fiscal stimulus uh, in that was as large as ours. Uh, second issue is uh, in terms of what the German uh, government has done uh, we have to keep in mind and this is a sort of cornerstone of German policy responses if you respond to a crisis in the short term, a credible commitment to not moving to an unsustainable position in your crisis response is a sine qua non condition for having an effective crisis response. If the German people were to believe that our fiscal response would jeopardize the long-run sustainability of fiscal uh, impulses, they would move to more precautionary savings rather than using the fiscal stimulus to basically foster demand. That's sort of, that you, what, what you're saying is that it would be ineffective because it would, it would be, be wiped out by extra saving by consumers. It would be totally ineffective and that's what you see in some countries where the sustainability is much more an issue because capital markets keep penalizing unsustainable long-term decisions, then I think you have a difference in the... But that's something that is deeply rooted in our policy framework that, uh, and I think it comes from the fact that we have a more long-term orientation even in a short-term crisis response. The feeling sometimes is let's have a short-term response and let's worry about the long-term once we're done with the short-term stimulus. It's in my view a totally wrong view of crisis response. Crisis response does have to be temporary, targeted, and it also has to be uh, at the same time measured and medium term oriented. And uh, whilst everybody talks about the three T's, the three M's, which also means it has to be meaningful, uh, that would be a third uh, condition. I think the German response has been meaningful, it was substantial. It had never lost out of sight the medium term orientation and I think it was measured in the sense that it was sufficiently front-loaded to have an effective crisis response at the point in time when the economy turned down. But to go into or to create the expectations that our crisis response can prevent the downturn, I think is creating long expecta wrong expectations on the side of the public. At the most, and we should be frank about this, at the most we can mitigate the downturn. We will not be able to prevent it 
nor, in my view, should we come to a, to a situation where we jeopardize public finances in such a way that the sustainability is questioned and therefore the short-term effectiveness is uh, questioned as well. So uh, I think that that is an important uh, consideration uh, when you talk about fiscal response. And on the monetary response, uh, I think you also have to see um, systems across the Atlantic and in Europe are different. We in Germany have a very profound unemployment scheme. We have a health scheme that is uh, very much available for everybody with a high level of health quality and quantitative measures for everyone. We have uh, not just pension and health, but we have social security systems in place. All these things in a downturn help to mitigate the effects of the downturn, which we call automatic stabilizers in economics, and it's very often forgotten if you just look at the discretionary policy on top of these automatic features of mitigating a downturn, you very often m compare two different things. U.S. has much less built-in stabilizers, so the discretionary response needs to be much more substantial in an economy like that, different in Europe. In Europe, you have a very you know, a more balanced mix between discretionary impulses and automatic stabilizers. Thank you. Um, finally, Jean Pisani Ferry, um, uh, who, as a sort of independent and extremely knowledgeable uh, observer, can be perhaps provocative, or I, I will try and provoke him a little. But um, first of all, um, do you buy this that, that Europe is being responsible and the US is? being irresponsible, or are there quite a lot of differences within Europe, some countries being more responsible than others? And I think, you know, when you look at the, the build-up of public debt in some of these countries, um, and you look at the states of their, say, of their banking systems, you begin to wonder about, I suppose, you know, are there European countries that could go bust? Are there countries in the Eurozone, for example, and people talk about Greece and Ireland as potential that could actually go bust and have to be bailed out in a very significant way and I wonder whether Germany is keeping back some of its money because it fears that uh, it may have to do this um, and are there countries uh, in Central Eastern Europe who have had very rapid expansions this combination of uh, their banks expanding a lot of borrowing in euros are there countries just outside the, the eurozone that may go bust uh, yes, let, let me start <coughs> by, by uh, saying on the, on the fiscal response in general that I, I very strongly agree with Axel Weber. There is no contradiction between uh, giving stimulus now and having a strong response to the crisis now and having a strong commitment uh, to uh, repairing the damage in the medium term. And in fact, they, you, need, you need both. And the, the more you're credible in the medium term, the more you can do in the short term. Uh, and this is especially relevant now as we, we see that we are not going to go out of the crisis in 2009 as expected at the time when the stimulus was, was launched. It's going to extend to 2010. We, we, we basically don't know for how long it's going to last. And we don't want to remove the stimulus too early. This is what the Japanese did in 1997. 19, uh, yes, 1997. And that was the, the, then the economy uh, collapsed. So we, we have to, to, to keep the stimulus, and the more we go into that, the more we go into debt, and the more there are questions about the medium term. So we need this, this, this strong uh, commitment. So what's the situation we have? Uh, I think in, in the US, there's a strong response and a, a very weak commitment uh, towards sustainability in the medium term. And in Europe, I think we have a, a, a weaker response, a weak response, I would say, less than 1% of, of GDP as a, as a discretionary stimulus, against uh, a drop that we can assess in 2009 to be from 2% growth to minus 3%, that's 5%. So that means at, at, at best we're responding one-fifth uh, to one-fifth. That's mitigating, but mitigating to a very limited uh, degree. And as regards the medium term, I would not say that we have a strong framework. I mean, the, the stability pact is not a strong framework. It's not strong e enough. I mean, it's, uh, and we are going to, to discover again and again that, that, in fact, we would need a stronger framework for the medium term at the EU level and at national level. Um, because uh, we've seen uh, countries, after 10 years in the euro, still having fiscal positions that are 
uh, not, uh, not satisfactory. We've seen Greece having 3.5% uh, budget deficit after several years of high growth. Uh, so in this respect, the stability pact did not, uh, did not operate as it should have been. And on top of that, the stability pact has, uh, in fact, neglected other vulnerabilities that we have discovered at the time of the crisis, that a country's position could deteriorate extremely fast because there were, in fact, implicit liabilities that were not taken into account. So I think we need a stronger uh, uh, commitment uh, to the medium term. Now, to come to your, your, your second part, uh, that's also why we are finding some countries in difficulty. Basically, the, the aggregate uh, public debt is the same in the U.S. as in Europe. But in Europe, we have diversity, so we have countries with public debt above uh, 100%. And, and, and with a weak uh, uh, response in terms of you know, correcting this situation. So markets have started to, to, to worry. Uh, we're seeing that on the price of, of debt uh, for, for Greece, for, for Ireland. Uh, and uh, we have to imagine what a crisis could be. And a crisis is possible in the euro area. That will be a funding crisis. That will be simply that a state will face increasing difficulty to borrow, and at some point, you know, the markets will now, not people be... People say that Ireland perhaps could go the way of Iceland. The, uh, the Irish problem is not a problem of, of having, uh, you know, had a, a, a wrong fiscal policy before. No. They had 25% public debt no. uh, percentage of GDP. But the size of the financial problems, the size of the, of the needs uh, to, to rescue the banking system are such that they, they were... So, what should we do... in if this happens, and this can happen, uh, the, the question is, uh, normally you would call the IMF. That would be the normal response. Um, it has been said by Joachim Almunia and, and others that uh, there would be a European solution. The problem is the credibility of the European solution, because we know that the IMF is tough. We know that the IMF has this technology. They know that the IMF can accept to, be people in the, to see people in the street, you know, burning... Uh, the, the, the flags with the IMF on it. Uh, the question is whether Europe has, the EU has uh, also the capacity to, to do that. Yeah, I'm just going to press you before I open this up to the audience on this. Um, I was talking to someone here in the European Council who uh, a couple of days ago, all 27 heads of uh, government came into town and had their meeting to coordinate uh, positions for the G20 meeting in London. And this rather... I suppose slightly uh, cynical uh, diplomat or official uh, said, do you know I've just sat through a European Council where 27 leaders spent three hours arguing about five billion pounds in expenditure. <laughs> um, Europe euros, doesn't... In fact. Euros, euros, so yeah. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't fill one with sort of confidence... Um, <laughs> Uh, about Europe's uh, co coordinated response. But I'm going to throw it open now. Um, Philip, just one comment to your last remark because I was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, so was this they, person. They who were discussing about the, uh, the five many billion. other issues, much more important than the 5 billion euros. They agreed also in the 5 billion euros. euros. Okay. Some uh, media. Well, I'm not going to I'm, I'm I'm have media, an argument. Not, not your newspaper, but some media. The day before, said, well, well, they will only quarrel around 5 billion euros. Simply, it was not true. Oh, okay. Well, they, I'm, they uh, I'm, sticking with, I'm sticking with what I'm told. Agreed, so. <laughs> they agreed a loan to the IMF of seven, 75 so. billion euros. They agreed on the extension of the uh, support to the non euro area members with uh, problems till uh, a ceiling of uh, 15, 50 uh, billion euros. They agreed on the common position of the EU countries okay. vis a vis the uh, London summit. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I, I, uh, we, we can I come back to some of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, we've got a lot of different issues on the table. Uh, feel free to address any of them uh, and all of them. I do, if I, w I, if I can, I'd like to provoke some. Uh, uh, some uh, debate between Europeans and Americans. Uh, so I will uh, start here. Well, thank you very much. And I think this is a very uh, distinguished panel. It's uh, obviously, uh, if, if, if the world's, all, everything in the world uh, finances were in these hands, we'd probably be a lot uh, better off. Uh, as, as I'm sorry, I should have said, I'm Jim Colby, Sr. 
Transatlantic Fellows, the German Marshall Fund, but also having had served for 22 years in the U.S. Congress. And in my service in the Congress, the one thing that I specialized on much of the time, Senator Bennett knows some, some of this, that was trying to get us to look at the long term and uh, things like Social Security and the long, uh, the Medicare and the things that have the long term impact. What really concerns me about what's going on now with the stimulus is how little we are talking about what are the longer term consequences of this, how it was addressed by the commissioner and the, uh, uh, and, and the central bank, but how are we going to finance these in the long term? What is the, consequence, the economic consequences of the amount of deficit financing we're adding here in Europe, in the United States, that becomes built in the interest cost of that, get built into the budget. What kind of a drag is that over the long term uh, in, in, uh, for the economy? Uh, and so I guess my question is that is, are we doing enough thinking about that in the long term? And even more specifically, are we trying to make the publics understand the consequences of this uh, and get them to deal with it? Because my great uh, dismay in the United States is we never think really beyond the next election and nobody really thinks in the long term. And I'm, I'm very profoundly discouraged about the prospects of this if we don't start thinking a bit more long term. If it's not a sort of term of abuse, that sounds a very European way of, uh, <laughs> of looking at it. But um, I'm going to take one or two more before coming back. There's a gentleman right there at the back. No, no. Yeah. Both of our countries uh, have said that toxic assets are, uh, were the big problem. Uh, before stimulus was even proposed in the level that we're now talking about, in the last few weeks, we've all seen uh, on the news the $175 billion either given or pledged to AIG. In the opinion of this panel, if we continue to give money to the underlying insurance, in other words, uh, by giving to insurance, we say there'll be no discount on ta toxic assets. They're going to be insured to 100%, which has been the American strategy, even though the Americans originally said they were going to buy the toxic assets at a price higher than their market, but lower than their original face value, both from a European and a U.S. strategy, should we go back to essentially buy at a discount to original and a premium perhaps to market, or should we continue the strategy that the U.S. has been doing so successfully uh, so far? <laughs> yes, that's supposed to be in a laugh line. Uh, <laughs> which is buying, buying the insurance, thus guaranteeing 100% uh, of an unknown amount. And, and by the way, I was supposed to say it at first, but I'm Congressman Darrell Issa from California, who voted against the TARP and the stimulus, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> I'm going to open it, but I just want to, is there someone from the United States here who's actually in favor of the stimulus and the TARP and would like to, uh, and will admit it? <laughs> Well, I, I'm getting no takers. Yeah, look, I, there. <laughs> there. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll then we'll then we'll move to the panel. Um, I'm John Kornblum from Berlin, uh, but I'm an American. Um, first place, I'm one of the probably 99.9% .9 here would admit that it's hard to figure out what you're for and what you're against. But what I wanted to say is that I think that what we have here and it's almost a case study for all of the U.S. the experts on Atlantic relations here, is a classic clash of cultures. And I think it's especially important for Europeans to understand and to examine very carefully what the President is trying to do and what his needs and requirements are. And I don't think I followed the European discussion fairly carefully, and I don't think that's, that's taking place. Uh, the President has got a bunch of smart people who are coming up with a program which hopefully will succeed. But at the same time, he is facing a true firestorm of public anger <coughs> over the financial community, set off in particular by the bonuses to um, the IG company. And I was looking, as in one can these days, I was looking at the American press this morning, and the um, people like Frank Rich of the New York Times are already saying this has been this is one of the president's major challenges, which he hasn't met yet. So he's under tremendous internal public pressure, which may not be good for the long term. I'm not saying it is. 
But it's important to understand that he's under tremendous public pressure to demonstrate action and, 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 and competence very fast. Thirdly, and one can debate this, but at least should be seen as part of the picture, he has presented his stimulus program also as a part of his program to remake America. And so he is, he is connecting the stimulus program with some medium and long-term goals he has in energy and education and health care. This may be wrong, but again, what I'm just suggesting is that it's very important to understand where he's coming from politically. Okay, so three sets of questions there. America's not thinking enough about the medium to, to long term. We still have a lot of problems with toxic assets, and there's this political uproar about AIG and the mm -hmm. rest. So, Senator, how do you, yeah. uh, in a sort of bi bipartisan, nonpartisan way, yeah, how do you well, put all this together? Uh, your, your intermediate question between the two interventions is there anybody that's in favor of a stimulus? I'm in favor of a stimulus. But I think uh, the ambassador's comment uh, is right on target when I said there were a lot of things added in the House. They were not added for stimulative purposes. They were added for policy purposes, to use the ambassador's phrase, to remake America. And quite frankly, without any kind of hearings, without any kind of significant debate, ideas that have been on the table for years that have never been able to get traction in the American political system got, as I say, thrown onto the luggage car of the train as it was leaving the station. So you find someone like me in great conflict here. As I think we need stimulus, we need a, a big stimulus, but an awful lot of these things are neither targeted nor uh, temporary. Uh, they are very much long-term changes, and they're going to be very expensive. And to Jim Colby's point, <clears throat> they do not address the long-term challenge that America has with respect to its entitlement spending. They simply add to those things and say, we're going to deal with that somewhere, sometime. And I talk to my Democratic friends, and if I may, I have a, a solution to the Social Security challenge, which has been scored by the trustees of the Social Security Administration as a 100 percent fix. And every time I talk to my Democratic colleagues and say, will you help me, because Mitch McConnell says, we'll get behind you as soon as you show up with one Democratic co-sponsor. <clears throat> They all say, yes, Bob, this is great. We will help you right after the next election. <laughs> and Jim's point is the next election never comes. So uh, I think the, the three comments have appropriately identified the challenge that we have in America. But uh, I give the president and his economic team credit for being serious about this and attempting to come up with a serious solution. But I give his party less credit as it moves through the congressional process, probably with the encouragement of the president, for <clears throat> taking advantage of this or attempting to take advantage of this for other agendas which end up threatening both the long-term stability of the economy and screwing up the uh, support for the stimulus by adding uh, extraneous items to the agenda. It is a very, very predictable kind of political ploy, but that doesn't mean it's going to work. I think what we're beginning to see here is that the sort of parody of a sort of transatlantic divide with the America on one side <laughs> and Europe on the other isn't true, that there are differences, as, you, as we've shown, within the United States as much as between Europe. But Jean Pizzani Ferry, how together is Europe? as it were, on, on this issue. Have, I mean, there's something at the summit, produce something which can be presented to the G20. But in terms of, is my country, Britain, on the same wavelength as Germany? Where's France in this? How, how coherent is the European Union in its view of, what, of what's being done and what should be done? On, the, on this uh, fiscal response, um, the 
clearly the, the response had to come from the member states, not, not significantly from the EU budget. And uh, so the Commission proposed, uh, as Recommend Munia said, uh, order of magnitude. And then each and every member state came with uh, its own uh, plan. And if you look at the plans, uh, they are very uh, heterogeneous, uh, not only in terms of size, as we said, but also in terms of priorities, in terms of content. Uh, the UK uh, has made the choice of supporting consumption, 100% almost. France has made the choice of supporting uh, investment, almost 100%. Um, this is not really compatible because uh, <laughs> If the UK supports consumption, basically they support also the consumption of imported goods and the implicit assumption in the choice of France and some other countries is that you don't want to support uh, uh, through the stimulus the consumption of imported goods. So it's not going to be, to be a very, very coherent and very lasting uh, response. Also, if you look at you know, what is the content, exactly the same debate you're having in the, in, in the US. Uh, if we look at what's the share uh, of innovation uh, we pretend that our priority is to go for innovation, for improving productivity in the medium term. What's the share of it in, in those stimulus packages? Very low, difficult to assess, but, but certainly very low. It means the forgotten part. Because the easy, easy thing to do was to go for construction, to go for things that have a, a strong domestic content and on which you have, uh, you have some projects that you can, you can go for because they've been you know, uh, under consideration for, for some time. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of really what is going to be this medium-term impact of the, of the stimulus, uh, there's they some, some uh, way, way to go. And I think, you know, we would need, uh, yesterday Bob Zalik was saying we need a monitoring. I think we need a monitoring in Europe as what is being done. Not only, if I may, uh, Joachim, the gift wrapping that you're doing, you know, that's great, we have the response, here is a gift to the, to the G20, but also much more uh, analysis of, of the appropriateness of the rep response on a country-by-country -country basis. I'm going to uh, let you come back on that in a moment, but I've, I want to take one or two more, um, one here, one there, and one there, and then, and then we'll come back and... Uh, um, to Mr. Weber and Mr. Almunia. Thank you so much. Erika Mann from Germany, member to the European Parliament. Um, I have one question which affects um, a discussion which we had this morning about innovation. And there was beyond, um, beyond uh, the point how important innovation is an understanding that probably uh, the fiscal stimulus which are given and the financial support to certain industry are maybe uh, not the right answers. And this certainly affects the car manufacturer, uh, if you see what's going on in the United States, but it affects Europe, if you take Opel, for example, to a large degree. And then if you take figures into consideration, we will have Korean man, uh, car manufacturers opening plants this year or next year. I don't have the, um, uh, the precise data. Uh, and they will produce uh, 600,000 more cars. You, you see Tata, uh, a new company, entering uh, European and American market as well. So are we judging actually development right? Are we not spending money in, in areas, you know, uh, which we will regret one day because we will have not the innovation which we want in new technology and in new industries? Okay, that's a strong point. And gentlemen, just there and then one here. Thank you. Tomohiko, Tomohiko Taniguchi from Japan, which is unfortunately a been there in that nation in many respects. Um, detoxific detoxification of your balance sheet will continue to be the buzzword for some time, which will result in the ever declining appetite for new loans, which will then culminate in missing an important link between the increased amount of base money projected by the central banks and the money circulated in the marketplace, which is the M3, M2, the money supply. How can you do this? That's exactly what happened in the case of Japan post-bubble. You did the quantitative easing by printing money in a massive amount, but the money supply did not increase because the real sector was so busy detoxifying their balance sheets. It's likely to happen in Europe and in the United States. What well, can you do this? And secondly, and briefly to Senator Bennett, you talked about flight from dollars. Where can the dollars go? To the surface of the moon? Euro can replace it? Are you serious about that? Okay, that's very strong. Uh, this one, one here. Thank you very much. Ed Morsman from the Salzburg Global Seminar. Uh, I live in Austria, 
It was um, an Austrian bank collapse in 1929, which began the depression in Europe, uh, the Credit Anstalt. Um, we read now, notably in German newspapers, that Austria as a whole is virtually bankrupt because of the exposure of its <coughs> banks to risk uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, I would like to know whether the panel agree with that, and if so, whether they think um, there will be a European solution for Austria, or will Austria have to go to the IMF? Mr. Weber. Well, let me, let me start by addressing some of the issues that were here. Um, I, was, I was first surprised that John and I are, were fully on, on, line, on one line, uh, because we're usually not uh, <laughs> in, in our response. But the more he spoke, the more I found that uh, sort of the differences kept coming up. Um, <laughs> The first thing uh, you said about the stability and growth pact being not a strong framework. Uh, that, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And the stability and growth pact, we've enacted in Germany a law for the sub-federal governments to have a very similar framework. And let me say the following. The stability and growth pact worked in Germany because we consolidated and went to zero budget. Uh, it didn't work in France, it didn't work in Italy, it didn't work in many other countries. For me, that's a clear sign that we shouldn't scapegoat the framework. What happened in these countries were pu uh, very poor policy frameworks in place in these countries. They didn't do the job. And ultimately, basically and ultimately, when you want to tighten the budget, it's up to your own government to do the job. So don't blame the Stability and Growth Pact. Blame the governments that haven't done their job. Second thing is, that's where we always dis also disagree slightly, you mentioned the IMF being a scapegoat. The IMF was a scapegoat because whenever it moved in and gave money, it attached very strong conditionality to this support. The argument that we can't do the same in Europe is simply admitting that we are not able, as Europeans, internally to ask for the same degree of uh, basically conditionality and <coughs> attach whistles and bells to these programs that we give intra-Europe than we would if an, out if an outside institution were to do it. That's not really an indication of a strong framework. And second issue where I think we both disagree uh, is you had this comparison of the 5% of the five delta moving from plus 2 to minus 3. Well, let me say the following. Part of the reaction we see now on the business cycle is not what we want to correct. We were complaining for a long period of time that we had a very big global imbalance. Some countries had negative saving rates close to zero. Some have saving rates like Germany or Japan that were 10, 12 percent. We're seeing saving rates go up in Germany even in the crisis, more towards 14, 15 percent. We see saving rates now at 5 percent in the US. We see them at 1.8 percent in the UK. My view is saving rates will continue to go up in these excess countries that have basically excessively relied on domestic consumption. I'd like to press you on, 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 on those two points that have been raised in the audience. I mean, is the Austrian banking system bust uh, with all the consequences? And, or perhaps I'll leave this one for Mr. Almunia. You know, will the Eurozone have to deal with this or will Europe be put in the humiliating position of, ha of having to tell members of the Eurozone, well look, you better go and sort that out with the, uh, with the IMF. Um, so I'll pr if you could answer the first one, I'll perhaps I'll... Uh, get Sounds like an ideal question to you, Joachim. <laughs> <laughs> but no, if you could answer... I mean, well, where, I mean what, what, you, you're right next to, to yeah. Austria. I mean, G German banking system and the Austrian banking system are pretty closely... <laughs> I see no problem in the sustainability of any European country's federal budgets. A federal budget has two sides. It has a spending side and it has a revenue side. If you have a problem with excessive spending, put up revenues. And so basically, we are ultimately in the position that sovereign states have the ability to raise cash in their own constituency to an almost unlimited amount. It won't be popular, but it may be needed. It's not the best thing to do it in a crisis. You have to do it in a post-crisis response. But I think all this talk of uh, euro area sovereigns being in a long-term problem with fiscal uh, budgets, it's just a lot of nonsense because it just, 
you know, just because risk premia on some financial markets have gone up for creditors who now ask a higher compensation from these countries if they borrow money to them, for me doesn't mean there is any underlying problem. These risk premia are simply a pricing of the so far track record of these countries to move to sustainable positions where the spreads are higher, the track record is worse, the only thing to do is improve your track record, then your spreads will go down. There is no sustainability problem whatsoever, it's a pricing issue and we shouldn't overplay this simply because uh, some financial market analysts try to make that a big issue. Okay. So does the European Union have the resources and the political will to bail out its own members if they, uh, if they do run into trouble? <laughs> and have we failed to learn the lesson of Japan in the I will, the, I will uh, 19, uh, try to give 19th. you uh, not the answer that you are waiting for, but my, my answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, let me very rapidly uh, touch upon three, three points. Uh, very of rapidly, the previous because discussion. I want to get back first, into that. I fully agree. Uh, with Jan and with others, that Europe, the European uh, countries, the EU members, not only the Euro area members, the EU members, needs stronger economic coordination. And I think this crisis is showing us how weak has been the efforts to coordinate economic policies that are uh, accepted to be a matter of national responsibilities in many areas, but a matter of common concern given the high degree of inter interdependence of our economy. So I fully agree with this, and I am convinced that from this crisis, the economic coordination instruments in Europe will be reinforced at the end. Second, the question of toxic assets or imper assets, as, as we, we uh, denominate it here, uh, because toxic assets are the assets linked with the subprime and with the structural products uh, mess, but the, there are other assets that are at risk in the balance sheet. So impaired assets. We have uh, adopted guidelines at the European level on how to treat this to maintain a level playing field to uh, 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 try to help uh, member states to find the adequate valuation systems, trying to establish a line on what kind of assets will be eligible for this uh, treatment and opening the different instruments. Uh, one instrument can be the, to ensure the assets as the British uh, have decided, another instrument can be to create bad banks. In some cases, some European countries for individual institutions have decided to go to this uh, instrument of bad banks. In some other cases, there are uh, nationalizations uh, in, in Britain, and in some cases, uh, to a high extent, in some, uh, in some institutions. <clears throat> we have defined guidelines. We cannot oblige one member state to decide how to treat, because it's not our money, it's their money who is at risk. But uh, we, we try to coordinate. And third, the question of medium to long term, I think is very important. Uh, the, uh, the other day during the European Council, there was a lot of concern about how to find a credible exit strategy to this uh, big effort from the fiscal side, from the monetary side, supporting banking system uh, institutions and, and uh, functioning. I think we have some elements of this exit strategy that are going in the good direction, and I will give you the optimistic side of our discussions. We you, have, you, you're allowed to give us the pessimistic. We okay. have in Europe, today I am optimistic. <laughs> uh, you are inviting me to be optimistic. <laughs> we have in Europe a common position for this G20 summit. It's, our priorities are more focused on uh, regulation and supervision of the financial system, but we are also discussing with our uh, partners in the G20, US, Japan, uh, emerging countries, uh, including China, also the uh, stimulus. And on the other side, they are putting in the headlines the stimulus, but they are also discussing with us the regulatory approach and how to deal with this. I think the 2nd of April we will have uh, a good consensus there. And I think it's a, it's a positive, very positive thing. Okay, but this I'm is not the only element. Let me tell I'm you. Stop, I'm going to stop you just there because I'll, I'll come back to you because there are a lot no, of no. people put their hands up. Let, I will come back to you. Let me, let me answer your take, question. Yeah. Why, why don't you want me to answer your question? Well, no, I, I will come back. I'm just very concerned that time okay. is going and that there are lots of hands. So I was just trying to... So uh, the question that Axel has not answered, I will want to answer it. Okay, we'll come back to that. Because okay. there was one there, one there, and one at the back there who's not... Yeah, that's the lady at the back, yeah. 
So this gentleman here first. I'm sorry, I was not trying to. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Emmanuel Zingeris. I'm an old, boring uh, member of parliament from Lithuania, Foreign Affairs Committee. So my question will be uh, to the audience that's like an echo to our economical discussions. We have radicalization of the societies uh, in uh, Middle Europe, in West Europe, especially in new member countries. So we should uh, know that if our co economical coordination will be unsuccessful, the street, the radical street is rising, and we have, you know, from time to time broken windows in the parliament. We have uh, radical movements from left and right rising. So we should calculate this political horrible result of these economical numbers. So I would like to have only a few words, if possible, about how to avoid uh, the social byproduct of all this mess. Thank you. Okay. There was a lady back there. And then, and then I'll take, take you there. Eva White from the AP. Is it completely unthinkable that there would be a European-wide stimulus in some of the countries that we're talking about which have problems with their finances? Spain and Ireland can't afford much of a stimulus. Um, so it's all very well for Germany saying it has generous systems in place when Ireland can't afford its social welfare this year. Um, is, I know this is something that uh, Mr. Almunia and other people have been reluctant to discuss, it, but is, is this something that will never, ever be on the table, or is there some idea there? Okay. <clears throat> Just here. Bruce Stokes of the uh, National Journal in Washington. A uh, question for Senator Bennett and I guess for Axel Weber. Um, let's assume we're in June or possibly in September and the economies, uh, the European and American economies, the world economy are still doing very poorly and the prospects of recovery seem even more distant than they do today. Um, would you anticipate at that point, as some people do, that we would get uh, another push for more stimulus in the U.S. and possibly in Europe. But most importantly, it seems to me, th what's the political debate that, you then, that one has in both sides of the Atlantic? In other words, Senator Bennett, what would be the constraints Congress would try to impose on that added stimulus, assuming they'd be willing to go along with it, they were convinced it was needed? Uh, what, what's the dynamic, the political dynamic that, that, uh, that a new request would, would trigger? Okay. I'm going to take two more from the audience, and then I'm going to invite you, because we've got about ten minutes left, to choose the, the questions that you want to answer and give uh, Mr. Alvidio the, the time I denied him a moment ago. So we've got just two together there. My question is about uh, focusing on regulation. What is the EU doing to socialize with the U.S. partners the need to fight um, tax havens as not only a way to uh, recover some part of the fiscal means that we need to, to provide the stimulus, but actually to rebuild trust and to actually prevent the kind of social broken bones that has been mentioned here. I'm, I say this, I ask this question because I've been raising this and I've been stunned by the, um, the, the, the absence of reaction on the part of our U.S. partners Despite the fact that President Obama, while a senator, he actually moved uh, a bill to uh, control tax okay. havens. <coughs> Cesare Merlini, Council for United States and Italy. Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Almunia mentioned the, 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 the coming G20 summit and he said that he expects to have agreement there. Uh, but I was struck by the fact that uh, in the discussion so far, uh, uh, there was no reference whatsoever to the relevance of what the major partners outside the West in the G7, in G G20, will do. Is this because they are irrelevant? I'd like to have both uh, an American and then a, and, uh, a European view. Of course, so I, I'm referring particularly to the major uh, uh, external countries, China, in the first instance. Okay, thank you. Yeah, shouldn't we be talking about China? Well, we've got about um, <laughs> 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Senator Bennett to respond to the questions that he'd like to first, and then we'll, then we'll, we'll go on. Well, I, <clears throat> I filled up two cards with notes here, so let me pick and choose. Uh, first, I want to make something very clear that I think has become muddy here. 
and that is that uh, we are assuming that the stimulus is all spending. In the United States, roughly 50 percent of the stimulus is tax cuts. And in my view, all tax cuts are not created equal, and the tax cuts that are in the stimulus package are not, in my view, appropriately stimulative. So if I can bounce to Bruce's questions, one of the things that I would be proposing if we get there is change the mix of tax cuts. And quite frankly, to be truly stimulative, in my view, the tax cut should not be temporary. It should be permanent because an investor in a business is not going to make the kinds of investment on the basis of a tax incentive if the tax incentive is going to go away in 18 months. And I think that's one of the problems that you have with the way this thing is structured. Uh, reference was made to the flight from the dollar. There will be no overwhelming flight from the dollar. There is currently a flock to the dollar that I spoke of, but that is what's holding down the interest rates in the United States so dramatically, and that will go away, and we're going to have to fund this thing with higher interest rates on the national debt at some future point, and I think that's very clear. Now, reference was made to the savings rate in the United States being up, and that's part of the problem short term because the balance that we were involved in was that the U.S. will consume more than it produces. The exporting countries will send us uh, the excess, and then we will pay for it with debt, which they will buy. And that is an unsustainable long-term structure, but that's the structure we have been in that has now collapsed. And finally, uh, it's very, very easy to say we've got to take care of the toxic assets, and I fully agree, but if you can come up with a system of valuing them that allows us to do that in an orderly fashion, please share it with us, <laughs> because that has been the difficulty we, we have in trying to, uh, to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jean Pizani, <laughs> sorry. On, on the U.S. And, and the EU, I think there is a fundamental difference, which is that uh, there is a need for an adjustment on the U.S. side uh, on the consumption, the share of consumption that is taking place, actually, yes. and that is, is partially offset by the stimulus, but that's a permanent adjustment that needs to take place. I mean, the, 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 the U.S. consumer has to save more, uh, and, and he cannot rely uh, anymore on the assumption that the price of... Uh, of its uh, assets, whatever the assets are, financial or, or real estate, is going to increase and do the job of, of you know, uh, substituting saving. So that's, that's an adjustment uh, that is structural. Mm -hmm. uh, on the European side, we don't have that on the aggregate. I mean, we, we, we have a growth problem in the medium term. That's a completely different problem. We don't have a macro adjustment uh, uh, for the uh, EU as a whole. We have problems inside. We have countries that have to adjust. We have countries with excessive deficits of their current account. But that's, that's in the G20 conversation, that's fundamentally different. I think this has implication for the, the, the way we approach the discussion. Um, and since you, you spoke about the exchange rate, I think the the one good news is that we, so far, we haven't had major problem with exchange rates. I mean, exchange rates are not part of the problem today. And even with the renminbi, now there's a truce with, uh, with China, which is, which is good news. They might be problem, part of the problem tomorrow if the markets start to speculate that the, the uh, U.S. response will be inflationary, that the European response will not be inflationary, and then, therefore, start to, to, to consider uh, potential uh, discrepancies there. Uh, a word on, on the question on, on Austria by uh, Edward Mortimer, uh, which I think is, is an important one. The question here is whether uh, we are going to, to go through uh, that, that crisis and, and in the new member states, the excessive borrowing in hard currency of private agents, uh, companies and households, whether this can be solved without some form of, of debt reduction at the end of the day. And that, that very much goes with, with the question you, you raised about uh, the social consequences in those countries. I think we have to seriously consider this question uh, and, and stop denying that, uh, that it, it, it might be possible. And if this happens, obviously this raises the question of who will bear the burden of it. Can Austria uh, do it alone uh, or, or, the, or the other countries that have uh, heavily lended to, to, to uh, the new member states? I doubt this will be possible. Uh, Mr. Weber, I do answer other questions, but perhaps you might want to answer that, or would Austria have to do it on its own? Well, 
being member of the European Central Bank, I don't want to answer questions for any <laughs> single member country except for the way that I see no sustainability problem okay. in any euro area country in terms of fiscal balances. I mean, this is hugely exaggerated. I know it's talk of the time, but it's totally and utterly out of line with fundamentals. Okay. Let me add one thing, give you a promise here. I can promise you the European response to this crisis will not be inflationary. That's why guys like me exist. <laughs> we, are, we are independent central banks and we know exactly when mm. to start tightening balances. What we see now in the crisis response is not inflationary because it basically leads to an increase in the balance sheet of the central bank in order to offset some of the decline in the balance sheet of, of banks. And so the outside effect of that, outside the banking system on the overall growth, and, and you alluded to that, uh, of money and uh, money in the economy, will not necessarily at this stage have to be used as inflationary. But I can promise you, once it starts looking inflationary, we will tidy up the mess. And another uh, very quick response on uh, the question on future crisis management. Having been deeply involved in crisis management now for the last one and a half years, uh, I think it's fair to say that the crisis response is such that we deal with problems as we come along and the ultimate attempt is to get in front of the curve uh, in terms of the policy response that we need, both in size and both in timeliness. I think this is what we're trying to do all along. I cannot rule out, if the situation deteriorates further, that there will be additional measures that have to be taken. It would simply not be in line with efficient crisis management to ignore such problems that come along. But let me also say it's very hard to judge the overall impact that this crisis has had on the real economy. Let me mention that we felt that until the demise of Lehman Brothers, that most of the fallout of the U.S. subprime on European banking she uh, balance sheets could be dealt with in an institution-specific case-by-case crisis management mode. Since Lehman, basically interbank confidence got totally destroyed, uh, and therefore we had to supplement this case-by-case -case approach with a full systemic crisis response of all authorities, including governments and central banks. The governments have put in bank rescue packages in place that are only less than 50% implemented at this stage. So there's a lot of response that has already been decided on that is being implemented. So I think, uh, you know, your, your question, do we have to take new decisions? My view is, let's first implement all that has been decided and not yet on the way. Thank you. Mr. Almunier, the, the last word. I go to your <laughs> previous question. So, we are dealing with uh, three uh, crises in three non-euro area countries now, together with IMF. We have agreed a uh, program for Hungary that has been uh, updated uh, recently and is going on. We have uh, agreed, together with IMF, a program for Latvia that will be updated with the new government uh, in the coming uh, days. And we are negotiating, and I hope we will announce an agreement uh, next week, with Romania. We can expect some more uh, crisis uh, or needs for financial uh, support in the non-Euro area members, probably yes, and we are equipped for this with this uh, increased uh, balance of payment facility, with a good cooperation with the uh, World Bank, uh, EBRD, IMF for sure, and with the support of the parent banks and the governments of the parent banks. And these links with Austria, whose government and central bank and uh, private banks are uh, fully committed in participating and helping in this uh, negotiation. I think we have the instruments together with the increased uh, lending capacity for the IMF that was also uh, agreed uh, recently and will be formalized in, in London 2nd of April. We have the instruments to avoid this crisis to become a default uh, problem. We have the instruments. In the euro area, the situation, as Axel said, is completely different. We uh, don't exclude problems. We are having problems. Uh, we look at the spreads every morning, and we know the differences uh, between the different uh, situations in the euro area. But we have instruments in the euro area to avoid even this kind of uh, IMF uh, programs. We have the political decision 
to use all our resources to react in a preemptive way and not only when the crisis exists. Is possible an EU-wide stimulus? I think, given the present uncertainty, nobody will exclude that further decisions will be required. The other day in the ministerial G20 and probably in the next uh, heads G20, the sentence, we are ready to adopt whatever action is possible to react to this slowdown will be there, and it's, it's true. But so far, we need implementation and monitoring we, well, what we have decided that is a huge amount of resources and, and decisions. And final point, China. China is uh, participating in the G20 actively. What they say, the Chinese, they say, first, we want to be part of the solution. Second, we are financing some of you through uh, the buying uh, government bonds. We want to have a more say, a more influential seat in the IMF. And I think it's an adequate balance of the I Chinese position. I have a point, position. I think, on that. But I'm going to have to close here. Um, I'd like uh, to thank you all. I'd like to thank those in the audience who contributed, commented, and asked questions. I've certainly learnt a lot during this session, but this is a debate we can be sure that's going to go on for weeks and months, many months, and perhaps years uh, to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank that was you. really a terrific discussion. I want to thank all of you. Um, I know there's some people waiting for you off that direction. Uh, we're now at the very um, end of the uh, Brussels Forum. Um, one of the things that I've mentioned throughout is the um, very uh, sound relationship we have with the Belgian government. Um, I think I mentioned on the first night that we have these beautiful pieces of sculpture that are throughout uh, the building that uh, Olivier Strabel uh, did, and he's with us uh, today. And we're just very, very grateful <laughs> to have these uh, extraordinary pieces of art as part of, uh, of this event. It's really made a difference, and we're very, very grateful for you. Um, obviously, we're very grateful to